as Bill mentioned tonight, we get to celebrate who we are as a faith and work movement. Uh, to help us do that, we are honored to welcome Dr. David Miller, founding director of the Faith and Work Initiative at Princeton University and a leading scholar on the history of the faith and work movement. Following David's remarks, we'll, have, uh, we'll hear responses from three different panels. The first panel will discuss our legacy, where we've been. The second will look at where we are today. And then the third panel will uh, consider the challenges and opportunities that we face currently. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please give, join me in giving an enthusiastic welcome to David Miller. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Let's do it one more time. What do you think? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right, now we, could, now we can go. So um, first of all, thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction. Thank you to Bill, the organizing team. Uh, it's a, it's a, an honor or a privilege to be here and be invited to give a keynote address. Uh, and I don't really know what the title was other than it's like who we are. So I, I, I have two pr provisional titles, and tell me which one you want to vote for. Are there any uh, Grateful Dead fans in the audience? <laughs> fess up, fess up. Close your eyes. Anybody? So we could call this, what a long, strange trip it's been. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know what to do with that, uh, I've kind of coined a phrase, and I have a, a third, a, a triplet to go with it. And that's from wow to how, and from how to what now. And that's what we're going to be talking about with this trip, from wow to how, from how to what now? I gave a presentation, gosh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago in, in New York City at an uh, uh, institutional finance conference. I was being talking on ethics. And in it, I embedded in the talk, they actually gave me permission to do it, that for many people, the source of, the source of their ethics comes from their religious upbringing. And whether they're active in their house of worship or not, that that's where they learned right from wrong, good from bad, truth from falsehood, beauty from its opposite. And so I mentioned this, that work could be a calling. It could be a way to honor and serve God, no matter how humble or how elite that is. Afterwards, there were about 20 people coming up when I talked, gave me their card, put it put on our mailing list. And, and one man came up. He had tears in his eyes. He was a Presbyterian and uh, probably 50 X years old. And he said, David, I go to church every Sunday, and no one has ever told me my work matters to God. I was, instead of feeling elated, I was so sad, so sad. Um, Bill, where are you? The man, Bill Hendricks, where are you? You're hiding somewhere, sure, somewhere. But if I only had ever written a book with the title, Your Work Matters to God, like he did, it uh, is a game changer. Anyway, I'm going to try to cover three, these three different modes, a bit like Charles Dickens, A Ghost of Christmas Past, Present, and Future. I'm going to talk about the faith at work movement, where we've come from where we are now and with the current era or phase of the faith at work movement. And the final thing I'll do is shift to talking about what's ahead, what do I see? Uh, I suppose I'm a, I'm a corporate guy by background, having been uh, in tech and international finance, living overseas, years of theological study, and then getting my, my PhD in ethics. And now my passion is combining these two worlds. And if I were to have one mission statement on my tombstone, it would be to help leaders integrate the claims of their faith, because our faith makes claims on us, with the demands of our work, because our work makes demands of us. And how do we navigate and integrate that when the two don't fit, when they collide? That's what I'm going to try to share a bit about. So I've become, a, I guess I'm a student of the faith at work movement. Some might call me a scholar of the movement. I wrote, read a, wrote a book about it uh, several years ago. I'm doing a revised new edition coming out called God at Work, the history and promise of the faith at work movement. And you all are part of that. And many of this room, you know it. I won't mention you by name. I wouldn't be standing here if 20 years ago you hadn't said, here, lad, let me teach you a thing or two. Here's some books you should read. So there's an extraordinary, there's some saints among us, and you know who you are. I thank you for that. And then there's the next round of saints. I'm seeing you out there. I see you, Mark Washington. I'm seeing you there. So there's the next round that are picking up the baton from, from us gray-haired set. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I sometimes talk, start presentations. I'm going to do this briefly, and we're going to jump into some stuff. So these are the, the two Bibles we read. This is my travel Bible. And if you can't see, this is the Wall Street Journal. 
Uh, we read each religiously six days a week. <laughs> Probably read this more religiously than that. By the way, is there anyone under 30 here today? Just show, quick show of hands. Okay, this is, this is called a newspaper. Um, <laughs> And it actually, it, it's at your door in the morning. It's extraordinary. And then it goes away. But um, anyway, I, I teach a course at, at Princeton called the Professional Responsibility and Ethics, the hist uh, and the subtitle, which the students nicknamed it, is Succeeding Without Selling Your Soul. And I say there are two books you have to read every day. You've got to read this, whether it's online or not, I don't care. And whatever your faith background, let's say you're an atheist now, somewhere in your family, your grandma, somebody was Jewish or Christian or something, figure out the holy texts of your tradition. Because guess what? They have a lot to say about leadership, decision-making, calling, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and so forth. So I'm going to leave these two Bibles together, but as some of you know who know me, I'm going to put them together with the Bible on the outside and the Wall Street on the inside, because the Wall Street Journal is not the ultimate guide. It's, it's the scriptures. So a few things. Um, let's look back. Let's look back. In this book, God at Work, The History and Promise, The Faith at Work Movement, I, I broke the movement out into three phases. It's sort of a histor historical review. I mean, we could go all the way back to Jesus and his small businessmen, and probably women, who helped fund and, and launch the ministry. He did not have any ordained rabbis as part of his initial disciples. But I went back to the end of the 19th century, and I've discovered between then and now, there's three what I call eras or moves uh, or waves of the faith at work movement. The first one happened just around uh, the late 1890s and continued for uh, up until about the First World War, and that was called the Social Gospel Movement. Many of you will know it, that there's a Protestant version of the Social Gospel Movement. You think of names like Walter Rauschenbusch, and there's a Catholic version of that too that many people aren't as aware of. That was sort of era one. And then it, when the war came, that sort of ran out of gas. The war was the focus of many things. After World War II, there was a, a second wave of the movement that started, and I called that the movement of the laity, or the laity movement. And that's where churches actually were beginning to say, both Catholics and Protestants, that, wow, your work can be a calling. And so they were supporting that. Unfortunately, there's a Latin phrase in Corvum say that sort of it, it, the heart went in on itself, and the church, with all due respect to the church, hijacked the movement. So instead of being, what's it mean to be a CPA or a lawyer or a sales rep or a ditch digger or a CEO, how, do you, how can that be pleasing to God? What the, the lady movement turned into is, we'd like you to be a Sunday school teacher. Oh, you're a banker, could you be in the finance committee? Oh, you're sort of social, would you be a greeter? So it, it kind of perverted it to be inward bending to serve the church as opposed to the lady out in the secular world. Uh, many people began critiquing that. So that movement sort of ran out of gas. And, and then the, I would say the late 1980s was the first time white collar uh, organizations began to companies have massive layoffs. You know, AT&T laid off 40,000 people. Now that's normal for those of you who weren't around then. But all of a sudden there was a disjointedness of fear. No job was safe, whether you were a white collar or, or a labor hourly worker, et cetera. And that faith at work movement is what I've been studying and passionate about for several years. Some of you in this room have asked me the question, is this, like we've had this conversation, Bill, is this still a movement or is it run out of gas? Some of you might remember there was something called Pet Rocks a long time ago, like people sold rocks as pets. Guy made a few million dollars. That was a fad, not a movement. <laughs> Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street, that was a fad, not a movement. Civil rights, that's a movement. Women's rights, that's a movement. LGBTQ+, that's a movement. And faith at work is also a movement. And a movement happens when three things aren't present. When an institution in society sh who should be performing their role does not perform their role. So there's a pent-up need. Let's say it could be civil defense. It could be any number of things. The second is that uh, people, began, people began solving, like, I need this, it's important to me, and they, they began, there's, there's no pope, there's no one in charge, there's no sort of senior official, and pockets of cells of people all around the country and now all around the world begin yearning to do something, and they, 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 they build these things. I mean, we, we've talked about this so many times, haven't we? It, it's, it's extraordinary. The... Um, uh, and the third thing is there's an organizing principle. In this case, the organizing principle for all of us in this room is I want to integrate the claims of my faith with the demands of my work. I don't want to have to go to work and be embarrassed that I'm a follower of Christ or to sort of shuffle my feet and not have to say it. I want to be who I am. That's actually changing a lot of things. Ten years ago, 12 years ago, 
most companies didn't want anything to do with that, didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. The general counsel's office, if you were publicly traded, said, uh-uh, anything to do with religion, that's bad. Uh, and the HR people often were also very uneasy because they thought religion was the cause of all the world's problems. Fast forward the DE&I movement, which some people are critical of, some people think it's terrific. Guess what? If you apply the logic of it to it, I want to bring my whole self to work, that's caused a whole new phenomena in this second wave, sort of where we are now. It's just started within the past decade of companies putting together just like there might be a women's group or a black group or an Asian American group or fill in the blank or a mother's group. Now there are groups also that are faith-based groups. And companies like Salesforce, uh, HP, Intel, American Airlines, we can go through the whole list. The, they have faith groups. And to be sure, you have to have an even playing field. So there's Christian groups, there's Muslim groups, there's Sikh groups, there's the Jewish groups. And people are saying, well, I, don't have, I shouldn't have to be embarrassed by this. It's who I am. And companies that are in, in bringing these programs in, giving permission for people to be their whole self, are often finding that it has greater loyalty amongst their employees. It attracts and retains people, particularly if you're in a field where you're competing for workers and talent. It's extraordinary. So what once was taboo is now changing. So in this current movement we're in right now, um, uh, one of the ways I just quickly invite you to think about it, a lot of times people think about faith um, at work. And in fact, I'll be at a party or barbecue or some invitation event or something. Um, by the way, in the Northeast, we do have barbecues. <laughs> and, uh, and there are some people up there who, who believe uh, in, in God, so, but that's a whole other story. Um, but I, I came up with a typology. There are four different ways. This is all based on research, not just me throwing darts at a dartboard. There are four different ways that are profoundly biblical, profoundly theological, of ways that we manifest or quote unquote bring our faith to work. Because someone once asked me, what do you mean bring your faith? Like you're bringing a dog to work? No, it's something, something different. The four ways really quickly is to think about work as uh, 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 first through the lens of ethics. So doing the right thing, personal probity, uh, personal piety, uh, not cheating on your expenses, basic things like that. But there's also an organizational level. The goods and services your company is providing, are they ethical? Are they good for society? Or are they damaging society? And maybe even at a societal level that you might be like today in the AI world, decisions being made in labs and C-suites today are way ahead of our legislators. I mean, our legislators, God bless them, can't even spell AI. So it's a bit of a problem. <laughs> It's people like you in this room that are having those discussions. So one, one is ethics. The second is expression. So how do you express your faith at work verbally or through symbols or signs? And that, for some people, might be sharing their faith, might be evangelizing. For others, it just might be saying, this is who I am. This is important to me. And they might have a sense of obligation. A Muslim might feel obliged to pray five times. Someone else might feel obliged to wear a certain attire or not. But the sense of bringing your faith to work, has it, there's an expression component to it. So many would say, I think sometimes in the Christian community, we kind of default into heavily weighted in one of those areas and not in all four. The third I call expression, uh, sorry, I, I call uh, enrichment. And that's sort of your faith is a bomb in Gilead. That when life is rough and the, it gets going, let's face it, work can be really tough. You can have a jerk as a boss or your coworker could be stealing credit for your work. But faith can help anchor and center us. It's an early morning prayer study uh, or Bible study or things of that nature or a group that, that gets together. Uh, and, and the final one I, I call, um, uh, it, it's, it's, in fact, the best way to say it, it's, it's a calling, is, is, is you, do you feel called to your work? And many people, even if it's hard work, and sometimes particularly if it's hard work, they view it as a calling. Work, it's about meaning and purpose. So ethics, expression, the sense of calling, meaning, purpose, and uh, enrichment to help you when the chips are down. That, to me, is a holistic, profoundly biblical and theological way to think about framing your work. And what I challenge everyone, myself included, so I grew up in the Northeast, like we're all embarrassed to say the word God, and we're never going to say the word Jesus, because we, we just don't do that in the Northeast. So I had to challenge myself to be better at expression. So now the irony is I'm in the God business. I mean, that's, I, I teach and talk about God all day long, but I never would have done this uh, years ago. So I, in a polite way, want to challenge all of you, identify which of those four circles or domains you're in, and then figure out which one you want to work on next that's not your go-to voice to grow a bit in. So as we look at the, uh, uh, this current movement we're in right now, the current uh, ghost of Christmas present with you, let me th so th throw, throw a few things out before we go to my um, thoughts, my prognostications for the future, such as they are. Um, 
One is, I've mentioned the DEI space. There are lots of organizations now and people that are really helping folks think about bringing these uh, of BRGs and ERGs into the corporate space. Uh, the, some of you may know Brian Grimm, the Religious Freedom Business uh, Foundation. They're doing a lot of work to take this all around the world. Uh, another group, I'm, I'm not sure, I think you might be here, but um, uh, Esther and, and Roy Tinklenberg, are you around? Yeah, there, good to see you. We last saw each other uh, over in Switzerland uh, last summer. Uh, they're doing amazing work helping companies think about ways to bring faith into the workplace. And it's not just BRGs and ERGs, but that's one component of it. And, and, and a thing I want to point out, and I mentioned we were in Switzerland, it's not just in the U.S. that this movement, so one of the characteristics of the current phase of the Faith at Work movement is that it's no longer just a U.S. phenomena. You can go to Hong Kong, you can go to, to Shanghai, you can go to Moscow, believe it or not, you can go to Bogota, you can go to Saudi Arabia, you can go anywhere in the world right now, and odds are and it, particularly if it's a country that maybe is not friendly to religion at all, or it might be a, a, even a, 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 a Muslim country, which is a, sort of a theocracy, there are faith at work groups springing up. And the interesting thing, less so today, but more so tomorrow, it's not folks from the West, so to speak, going out to launch these. They're local. It's local men and women who are changing the game, and they're doing it in a contextual way that works for their cultures and society. So this movement is not just, you know, everyone says, oh, Americans are so religious. Uh, it's a global phenomena. It's a global phenomena. And I personally take um, help, uh, I don't know, encouragement from that. There's a few organizations, some of you know the Kern uh, Family Foundation. They really uh, put some juice into this movement. They helped underwrite and support a lot of uh, small uh, 501c3s and ministries, uh, as well as I received a grant from them to, uh, to uh, work on a project. Um, and the man who made a hundreds of millions of dollars selling his company as an engineer. He set up a foundation that he wants to spend it down by year X, and they've given away tons and tons of money. And it's all built, well, there's a couple things, three different categories, but one is faith, work, and he wanted to add the word economics to it. So faith, work, and economics. So what we're doing is attracting funding, it's attracting people, uh, it's, it's really extraordinary. I think in the early days, the faith at work movement, it was like, wow, you mean my work really matters to God? I mean, it's true. And, and I think it had a bit of a personal piety to it. It was a bit inner-centered. And fair enough, because with all due respect to our clergy, most of the churches, obviously not all, but most of the churches, my research shows, still don't know what to do with Monday. <laughs> they don't know what to do with Monday. And ask yourselves the question, when was the last time you heard your pastor, when you heard your pastor preach a sermon not just mentioning work and passing, but that that was the centerpiece of the sermon, or an illustration was a centerpiece. Most of us would say, I, I can't think of the last time. That's a sad thing. And in some ways, I, I charge our respective seminaries around the world to pay attention to that, because they're the one that train our clergy. So a few things I would say about the movement today and as we look forward, this is gonna sound like I'm contradicting myself, but bear me out. I think the movement is becoming more diverse, which is great, and less diverse, which concerns me. As far as the more diverse, there's more accent on black and Latino engagement. It's not just white folks. Uh, it's more, more and more women are in leadership positions. You have some of the, the great uh, forerunners of that included in this room. For if you don't know Kathy uh, Leary Alstor, if you'll see her, Catherine, she, the people like that have done extraordinary things. Um, uh, and there's some great books and things out now. Tom Nelson is here. Anything he writes, you should read. Uh, Tim Keller, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, he also wrote a terrific book which, with, with, with Catherine that is uh, well worth your read. And that'll give you tools and ideas and frameworks for how to think about this. What do I find less diverse? Um, the mainline church is sort of asleep at the switch in this. There's no one here. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. The, that this, I think, I would describe largely as an evangelical uh, crowd, and maybe I'm wrong, and if so, I hope I haven't offended anyone. But the mainline church it just doesn't know what to do with this, uh, and it's a, it saddens me. Uh, because uh, in the earlier days of the faith at work movement, there was evangelicals, progressives, all in the same room, and people weren't fighting about politics. They were talking about, how, how do I live out my faith at work? And it was wonderful. There wasn't this politicization or weaponization of faith. Um, 
There's new wineskins, new organizations, uh, the Denver Institute for Faith and Work. There's, there's just a lot of amazing things going on. But I am a bit concerned about the politics. Um, I was at a conference once, and I'm obviously not going to name where it was, someone or who said it, but someone, one of the speakers, made a comment sort of mocking um, gay people. And people laughed. Now, whatever your theology is about gay, whether that's pleasing in God's sight or not, whether that's a sin or not, let's just park all that. I don't think God wants us to mock anybody. And, and to see people in this movement getting into politics and so forth, personally, speaking for myself, I find that uh, a sadness. Another thing is we look to the future and where we are now, so I want to caution us that we don't get too clubby, uh, that we don't get too internalized, too um, uh, self-centered in things. Uh, we, we need to think also about... Um, something I call the changing of the guard, the changing of the guard. When I started this, studying this movement and trying to understand, there were many people I went to, as I mentioned earlier, to help me think through. I'm going to read some names off right now. Some of you may never have heard of them. Most are alive, but some are not. It's a little bit like that Monty Python move. I'm not quite dead yet. <laughs> so uh, here's some names. John Beckett here in Texas, your own Howard Butt, Bob Slocum, Bob Buford, Bill, we know you're alive, Bill Hendricks, Bill Pollard, Buck Jacobs, Catherine, Leary Alsdorf, Cheryl Batchelder, Amy Sherman, Shirley Rolls, Johanna Zilesberg, Al Arisman, David Gill, Steve French, Andy Mills, Buddy Childress, Tom Nilsson, Gil Strickland. The names could go on and on. But at some point, those people are going to pass the baton. And who's going to be there to pick it up? And what are they going to bring to add the movement just as those folks picked up from someone else? You know, as I was trying to think of, was there a verse I could anchor us in in our conversation today? And so what book should I pick? What book? Guess real quick. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And why did I pick Matthew? Because we all love, don't we, the generations. Like that first Matthew, when he's like, let's skip over this, please. Right? Who begot who, that begot who, that begot who. Well, those three sets of generations of going from, uh, from Abraham to David and David to Josiah and from uh, uh, Jeconiah to uh, Jesus, that generations matter. People pass the baton. And that's my big charge to everyone in this audience, that wherever you are in this journey, pass the baton. Another thing I want you to think about is that's different is the movement used to be essentially self-sufficient. No one was bothering it. It kind of lived off its own self uh, and was under the radar. Now it's, it, we have SCOTUS, we have Supreme Court of the United States making decisions. Some you may agree with or disagree, but suddenly there's laws and legislations and rules, some you may like, some you may not, that are interfering with kind of this movement, which always could kind of just, as long as it behaved, it could go under the radar. That's going to change, and I don't know if that's going to be for good or bad. Keep an eye on that. Another big thing to think about, the difference between publicly traded companies and privately traded companies. The, uh, the sort of SMEs, the small, medium-sized enterprises, they can do things that many others can't. And publicly traded companies, they have more handcuffs around them. It's a tricky thing. That said, even there we have public leaders. The Bill Pollards of the world, Ken Melrose from Toro, Bill Pollard from ServiceMaster, Steve Reinemann from PepsiCo, Brad Anderson from Best Buy, John Tyson from Tyson Foods. So John Tyson now and Pat Gelsinger, CEO of Intel, Tony Towns Whitley, uh, TEO, CEO of SAIC, a big defense contractor, they're the new public faces of faith at work. Men and women, Tony is a woman, who have been willing to put their reputations at, race by, uh, at risk by publicly saying, I am a believer, I am a follower of Christ. But they're doing it in winsome, effective ways. And oh, by the way, they're awfully darn good at their jobs. <laughs> they're awfully darn good at their jobs. So as I wrap this up, uh, and we bring up our panel here in a moment, these uh, three sets of panels we have, uh, I, I want to challenge you to think about where you fit in this framework that I mentioned, the four parts. I want to challenge you to think, are there things about the movement that make you a little uneasy that you don't like? Well, how do you speak up and alter it to make sure it's done in a God-pleasing way, that the movement be focused on the movement itself and not other agendas, which could unfortunately, I think, turn people away. And the more we can grow in diversity in the fullest sense of the world, the word to represent all of God's children around the world, I think that would be a blessing to all of us. So, I thank you for inviting me. And I wish you all an extraordinary journey every day of faith and work and experiencing God at work every day. And remember, by the way, when I chose that title, it's God at work as a verb. God's busy. God's doing something. God listens when we pray. 
but also it's spatial. God is present with you. You are not alone. God bless you all. Thank you. An august group coming up here behind me. I'm a little worried if they're going to attack me here or something. Let me pull this to the side so I can see you all. My name is David Gill. Uh, I was a professor of Christian ethics or a professor of business ethics, either in a theological school or a business school, for 40 years. Um, I'm the author of more than 200 books. Uh, they're all stacked on the back table there. There's only one title, but there are more than 200. <laughs> and this book... Workplace discipleship is everything I know about workplace discipleship, the kind of 101 course. I want them to be. Hello, my name is Elaine Kung. I worked for AT&T for 33 years and retired or refired after a good journey. Now I am the founder and the co-chair of Call to Work since the 90s, so it's almost 30 years. And uh, also chair the Chinese Board for the Theology Work Project. Glad to be here. And good evening. I'm Jerry White. I'm with the Navigators. I was the uh, CEO of the Navigators for uh, a little over 18 years. But I've also had 37 years with the United States Air Force and uh, am a practitioner in the space of workplace, retired as a major general. And so I've seen it from the worker level, but also from the leadership level as people are living out their faith in the workplace. I'm an engineer and a scientist. Well, thanks. Can we give a quick round of applause to welcome yeah. our panel? So you can, see it, you can see already they don't need me because David took charge right away, which I'm thankful for. I want to start not with you. I want to hold fire with you. Would you please tell us, at first, thank you for your service to our country. Tell us what you, because this is the, the Christmas past. We're looking at the legacy of the faith at work movement. What are some attributes or characteristics you think about or anything you'd like to comment about? Just make a couple brief comments. We'll go down the row here. Could you start us, please? Yes. Well, the first thing is we have to recognize that the faith and work movement is just that, faith in your work. And people see the faith in your work. Especially as a senior leader in the Air Force, I couldn't go in and preach. But believe me, everybody before I came on the scene did their homework. And they knew who I was. They knew I was a Christian. Because if they're going to work for me, they're going to know that what I believe. So they are watching you like a hawk. And they're waiting for you to violate the ethics or whatever it would be. And they will remember what you did right and what you did wrong. Well said. I had a friend in seminary when I was doing theological studies. He said, Miller, you may be the only Bible anyone ever reads. Yes. That's right. Oh, my behavior matters. I want to jump around. Professor Gill, you tell us what's on your mind about sort of thinking legacy, and we're going to save the best for last, and Elaine, have you jump in. David, I'm not ready for your questions interrupting me. Uh, well, what I, what I would say is I, I like the term workplace discipleship. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like faith at work, but I also wonder about hope at work and love at work and, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. And so... My concern is how are we disciples? How do we follow Jesus Christ, whatever workplace we're in, whether that's in the kitchen doing cooking or whatever it is, workplace discipleship. Great, that's super. Elaine, how about you? Amen to the two brothers. And we as Christians at work are so blessed. You are not going to work alone. God is our CEO. And AT&T pays, pays my salary. <laughs> we got the best deal. You're not there alone. I do one-on-one -on -one with God all the time, and I would like to share more in my next few minutes. That's great. So, bouncing around here, Dave, you had a couple of prepared thoughts. Could you share them with us? Yeah. Uh, you David, thought I'd never get there, did you? <laughs> well, I have to condense my remarks now. Uh, well, I understand our, our task here with your uh, launching out, out there, David, is to talk about the legacy. Thank you. And so I've been thinking about this now. Of course, I love your book. Uh, from 2006. I also wanted to mention to everybody, there's another book out there which I'd like to highly recommend, which is Andrew Lynn's recent book called Saving the Protestant Work Ethic, Creative Class Evangelicalism and the Crisis of Work, is not really very well titled because it really does follow up on your research, David, and expand it. And of course, we're waiting for your next book too. Uh, now, of course, I've 
I've uh, benefited from what have become modern classics in the field, and David was mentioning these people like Bill Hendricks, Lee Hardy, Amy Sherman, Dorothy Sayers, Bill Peel, this is my list, uh, Catherine Leary, Alsdorf, Tim Keller, John Beckett, Wayne Alderson, Max Dupree, Bill Pollard, Paul Stevens, Robert Banks, Al Ayersman, and others, some of you in the audience here. So there's a hall of fame here, and I am so grateful for those folks. But I have to say this about our legacy. My own now 58-year journey working on faith at work issues began not with these people. It didn't begin with faith at work organizations or literature. It began in my home church. It began with a church that insisted that Jesus Christ is not just savior for the inner life and the afterlife, but Lord of all of our life, including our thinking, our behavior, and our work. And they insisted that all scripture is the word of God, is inspired, is profitable, and is the guide for all of life. Now these two affirmations that I learned from my church, those are the two forces that are the legacy that have driven me for all of my life, is those two convictions. My home church didn't help me much in teasing out the specific workplace lessons of Jesus in scripture, but that foundation was critical. So as we think of the roots and heroes of our movement, I say, let's hear it for faithful Jesus and scripture centered churches and their pastors. You could applaud, but you know, you don't need to. <laughs> uh, the second section, which I'll just skip over, is the importance of people who were teaching us about developing a Christian mind. I'm talking about Francis Schaeffer, John Stott, Arthur Holmes from Wheaton College, the people at Calvin College and Wheaton College, the Toronto Institute for Christian Studies. There's a whole a group of people who were pounding on all of us who were students back in the 60s and 70s saying you need to develop a Christian mind, not just a Christian spirit, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, not just your devotional life, but your mind. We need to think Christianly. And so this really was a powerful influence on a lot of us, and I want to pay tribute to all of those folks. Uh, I also want to celebrate and salute the efforts of InterVarsity, and, they, and Pete Hammond in particular, okay. but I would also mention Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, had a coalition for Christian out, outreach that was sponsoring amazing Jubilee conferences, addressing Christianity and engineering in many different vocational fields decades yeah. before our more recent Faith at Work Summit conferences. Uh, and there were organizations that were helping us too. While I was doing my BA and MA degrees in history at Berkeley and San Francisco State in the late 60s, it was a group called the Conference on Faith and History. Christian professor, history professors, a lot of them at Indiana State and other secular institutions, but they were believers, led by Richard Perard, that helped me integrate my faith with my study of history and then becoming a school teacher. And at the same time, the Christian Legal Society, the Christian Medical Society, the National Association of Christians and Social Work, Nurses Christian Fellowship, and other Christian professional groups were way down the road that we've been trying to travel now, but in their particular professions. I want to salute those organizations too. And finally, we must not forget the contributions of our black churches and leaders who've modeled holistic discipleship and mutual care in their churches, which includes economic and workplace dimensions. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about work. Who helped us realize that we must welcome, respect, learn from and serve all of God's children as our customers in our workplaces, as our fellow employees as well. Who prodded us to promote entrepreneurship so that those with plenty of faith would also have some meaningful work in which to express it? Thank you, Lord, for Martin Luther King, for banker Robert Lavelle, for John Perkins, and other brothers and sisters. You know, fairness, justice, and love are key virtues in our faith and must characterize us as employers and employees. That's faith at work, it's gotta happen. And honestly, it's also the Christian women's movement that has also helped us welcome our sisters to our workplaces and, and uh, give them honor and respect and protect them from harassment. Mm -hmm. And it is the creation care movement that has helped us think more about good stewardship of God's planet. So I'm saying let's hear it for these prophetic voices and faithful contributors to the faith at work movement. We've too often neglected but these other contributors. Let's give it up for David it. and all the people he just mentioned. Here, here. So speaking of women, would you speak for all the women in the world? Love to. I'll start from a personal level. 
I'll start my response by telling you a Cinderella story. My story is actually a God story. I grew up in a poor, non-Christian family in Hong Kong. We were homeless at one point, couldn't afford elementary school tuition. After immigrating to U.S. as a teenager, I became the first generation Christian. God changed me from a troublemaker to a peacemaker, hmm. a new life filled with miracles. I received my engineering degrees from Cornell and Princeton. I met my Prince Charming. We raised two godly young adults, and we have become proud grandparents. My Christian faith is a whole life discipleship journey, very practical and real in all areas of my life, especially my work, where we spent most of our wake hours. I exercise my spiritual discipline and experience God's presence and intervention in my daily life, so I can say God is my CEO and AT&T pays my salary. In my 33 years of rewarding career, I enjoy going to work with Jesus through the ups and downs, having my regular one-on-one -on -one with him. In my office, I kept an empty seat for Jesus, so I'm reminded to discuss my every people project issue with him. I experience how God cares about my work. Work is a blessing, and work is more than a paycheck. So I founded Call to Work almost 30 years ago to do the three E. Encourage workers, equip leaders, and expand faith and work kingdom networks. To help workers experience, then God is Monday, TGIM. We had annual call to work Christian professional development conferences. Speakers like Karen Johnson Moy, Ed Moy, Pete Hammond, Doug Hunter, he's here as well, and our fierce leader, Bill Hendricks, and then our beloved late Bob Harp of Biola University, the Lausanne Workplace Ministry Catalyst. Bob enabled others to thrive in the faith and work movement, including me. Our call to work ministry went through seasons of launching, pausing, preparing, and growing. In 2018, we retired or refired. God made it clear when to retire and where and how. In 2019, we experienced a year of faith and work ministry breakthrough changing from spurts of moments into long-lasting movements. 2019 became a pivotal year when Bob Harp invited me to attend a Lausanne Global Workplace Forum in Manila, along with 750 faith and work leaders like David, Dave, Jerry. That's also when I approached Jerry to become my mentor. And we, be, we have done our regular one-on-one -on -one for over 20 times. What a blessing. Ten of us were also interviewed in Manila to produce the global classroom on faith and work, including Wendy Simpson from Australia, one of our keynote speakers here. In 2019, God opened doors and showed many signs of faith and work movement at the global, regional, and local levels, both in the English-speaking and the Chinese-speaking worlds. The Theology of Work Project invited me to serve as the chair for the Chinese board. Then 2020 brought us COVID, opening the floodgate of online platforms for workplace discipleship. During the peak season, I would give 30-some talks a month and did 20-some one-on-one coaching a month. God has brought the world closer together in COVID. Call to Work encouraged and equipped 2,000 paid students from around the world. I taught 30-some series of courses and video programs both in English and in Chinese. These workplace and whole life discipleship materials were developed from my 33 years of faith and work experience and my integrative life from work, family, church, and community. In order to enable others, now published eight books in Chinese and English, and also equipping a team of 50 call to work leaders in US, Canada, Asia, and Europe to pass on the baton, passing on generations of leaders so they teach their students. So Call to Work also expanded faith and work kingdom networks like partnering with Lasan in uh, September, Seoul, Korea. We're gonna announce the first annual International Day of Faith and Work uh -huh. for May 1st, 2025. Hmm. You're the first one to hear it. <laughs> Woo -hoo. All right. We partner with the Chinese Lausan seminaries, ministries to mobilize faith and work movement among the Chinese churches locally and globally. We partner with public reading of scripture and produce the Chinese PRS.org, just to name a few. This year, like David Miller's message, 
from this summit. Moving from wow to how, from general to specific, it's exactly the same focus for our fourth annual Chinese Faith and Work Summit coming up on June 21st. God's story continues to make the impossible possible, mobilizing this exciting faith and work movement, multiplying workplace disciples. So Jesus is coming back soon. The train is leaving the station. Let's all hop on to accelerate this faith and work movement. Thank you. All right. So, so what do y'all, do y'all think Elaine's going to be in the, the, the category of saints that we all look, look up to someday? It's like, wow, she was a difference maker, particularly internationally. Thank you. Jerry, share thank your you. remarks, please. David, thanks for your, uh, your message today. Two words stand out to me, and the words were fizzled out. <laughs> okay, now, that was what some of these movements did. Yeah. And I want to tell you that the faith and work movement today is not fizzling out. Absolutely right. I believe it is on the march. And as I said, I spent most of my life as a practitioner, as an ordinary laborer in the workplace. You know, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, and a faculty member of the United States Air Force Academy. And then finally, as a senior leader, as a general in the Air Force. And then, of course, I did Say, I, someone says, well, Jerry, what is your calling? I said, well, to the Air Force. And, I, and then they say, well, what about the navigators? I say, yep, that too. <laughs> but the fact is God put his first hand on me through a businessman who led me to faith. And so the greatest struggle that I had was leaving my military career in becoming a reservist instead of full-time military and coming full-time with the navigators because I just felt that I was leaving my mission field. And it really was hard. But I was deeply influenced by men like Bill Garrison, who was on the Dallas Seminary Board, an attorney here in Dallas, for Lieutenant General William K. Harrison, who was known as the Christian General. And I've sat at his feet in my house listening to him he was the only man that MacArthur could trust to negotiate the peace wow. at Pamujan. And then others, and by the way, later served as a board member of Dallas Theological Seminary. But I became deeply convicted that the majority of the evangelism is done and discipleship it should be done by ordinary lay men and women in the workplace. Now, frankly, as CEO of the Navigators, I couldn't pound that drum because we had a lot of things, but now I can. <laughs> I mean, I, I am freed up and I can pound, pound away, pound Jerry, pound away. Yeah, <laughs> we can go after it. But we're also, I'm very involved in the Lausanne movement and with that Global Workplace Forum in Manila in 2019. And this upcoming Lausanne Congress in Seoul, Korea is going to be historic. It will be the First, and I believe, and some of you historians, and by the way, did you notice that David Gill and I are the only ones using paper and she's using, we're, we're old school. <clears throat> uh, but the fact is, I think it will be the only mission Congress in history with a third of the attendees being ordinary lay men and women out of the secular workplace. I still remember when I was trying to raise money for the uh, Cape Town Congress that a million dollar funder of the L workplace, uh, pardon me, of the Lausanne Congress in Manila said, Jerry, if there aren't more laymen, count me out. Because of the 4,000 in Manila in 89, only 40, 4 zero, were part of that. He said, you've got to have more laymen. And so at Cape Town, we mandated that, uh, that actually 10% come from the workplace. And now we're going to have uh, almost 1,300 to 1,500 at the Lausanne Congress in Korea. And Michael O has said, in his, uh, who is the CEO of the Lausanne movement, he said it's the 99% who are going to do the work of evangelism. Way back in 77, I published a book called On the Job, Survival or Satisfaction, because I was so convicted 
that we needed to think about work differently. I would like to say that, that now, and David has uh, shown this, that I don't think the sacred, sacred secular divide is as big an issue as it once was. I think we've seen it, but we have not yet implemented it. It is still not caught into our, uh, into our vocabulary and into our practice. And many have heard that Billy Graham said that the next great movement of the gospel to missions will be through the workplace. But it has to be done by more than just being forced by missionary access problems to get into a country. But it has to be people believing that they are called to their work. And now David has given a great perspective on faith and work. And we've seen these key turning points in the last several decades. But we're, we must go beyond where we are now. And that's the reason for this summit, David. We, we've got to be together, and we've got to propagate this. And now you in the audience all believe that. But somehow, we've got to go beyond our own organizations and think generically and systemically in the body of Christ so that we can't just rail against what is not being done, but we must say this is where we're going in the future. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David, for your presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so I was once taught uh, something when I was in my seminary days and going through theological studies at a homiletics course, and they said you have to land the plane. Like, you have to land the sermon. You don't take up, and, like, you have to land it. So as an Air Force pilot, yeah. you landed the plane. We have 24 seconds left for our module. We got in, in time early. So how about one more round of applause to these legacy people? I wish we could keep going more and more, but we do have to swap and let the second panel come in. And thank you again. All right. And they'll be around if you want to visit. So right. thank you all. So to start us off, again, you know everyone's bios, so I won't repeat that, but I would uh, like, Bill, could you give like sort of the 30 second, who are you, okay, is it Catherine and, and Chip as well, and then we'll go into our conversation. I'm Bill Hendricks. I, th I think you've met me, and I think you've heard my name, so. Thanks, Bill. Your I'm, work matters to Bill, right? Is that that's it? That's it. Right. <laughs> I'm Catherine Gates. I've been in the faith and work movement since 2013, starting with Work Matters for seven years, and then over the last few years, been focused on women. So right now, I'm the VP of Partnerships for the Polish Network, and I'm also the author of The Confidence Cornerstone, A Woman's Guide to Fearless Leadership. Terrific. And Mr. Voka, Dr. Voka. Great. That's great. I'm Chip Roper, and I was aggressively wanting to sit down, apparently. <laughs> That's funny in New York. I don't know what the deal is here in Dallas. Uh, I'm the president of the VOCA Center. We help Christians navigate their careers, and we help Christian organizations navigate their work together. We are based in New York City, and we serve people all over the world, and it's great to be here. Great. Thanks, Chip. So uh, we've shifted from the ghost of Christmas past to the ghost of Christmas present, so to speak. Where are we today? Kath, would you start off and share your remarks and things you've been thinking about as you've prepared for these comments? Absolutely. Thank you, David. Um, so polished emboldens women in their faith and work. One of the things that I've seen is um, there is an increased need for women to have community with other working women. Um, I've worked with men and women through Work Matters, um, but there are, and the nice thing is there's an increasing number of organizations that are serving women um, from community, like the Polish chapters that we provide and others that do similar work, um, even executive leadership roundtables um, and, and such things like that. One of the things that I um, am noticing, though, is there are a lot of organizations, and, and I have been involved in resourcing people right from the beginning. I was the director of Work Matters Studies, so we helped people find workplace Bible studies, or we developed workplace Bible studies and helped them also find them. Um, that really helped people learn how to apply God's word to their work, to see the relevance of scripture to their work. And there's a, there really are a lot more resources than there've ever been, certainly when I started 11 years ago, the problem is that a lot of people don't know where to find them. 
And so what is starting to happen more and more, and even um, while I was at Work Matters, I was trying to collaborate with more and more organizations realizing that we're not gonna grow out of our regional Northwest Arkansas area um, easily unless we partner with other organizations in other parts of the country. And um, that met with some receptivity, some resistance, some just like, mm, that sounds good, but don't have time. But I'm seeing rec more recently an increased heart, desire, and even um, want to service to bring that collaboration to fruition. So there are organizations like Craig Carter started Courageous Third to provide a platform where you can find all the resources. Faith Driven Entrepreneur has traditionally um, provided access to events, not just their own, but on other organizations. Um, I Work For Him provides the Awaken Podcast Network, and they're working on tapestry. So there's increasingly a heart for not only collaboration, but also helping people find all of those resources. There's a lot of work to do yet to make sure that you know, they're easy to find in terms of the specific category of resources you're looking for, but at least I'm starting to see a movement there. But going back to women, I'm also seeing um, more male allyship, which is, um, is a wonderful thing to see. Men really stepping up to say, how can we, um, how can we help, how can we pour into, how can we support the women who are really trying to rise up as leaders as well, and really being proactive. There's been several situations like that that I've seen. And so those are all encouraging. There's so much more work to do, but, um, but they're really encouraging. Um, I wanted to share like a really quick story. Um, I, one thing I would challenge, like I really do think there is an issue with the sacred secular divide still that we really have to work on. I, I am mentoring a young woman who works for a company with Christian leadership. I was mentoring her, so I'm absolutely pointing her to how to apply God's word in her work. And she started the Work Matters Institute. Um, and in, two weeks in, she sent me an email basically saying her mind was blown that she didn't realize that she was supposed to co-labor with God. And I just, it just drove home for me how deep-seated that belief still is for so many people. I still see a lot of people think they live, they're living out their faith at work just because they've organized a prayer group or they're doing a Bible study. But really, we need to help each other recognize that God's design for work is for us to lean on him in our work, to co-labor with him in our work, to bring him into it. And, and when I see people doing that, when I see people realizing that they actually can co-labor with God, lean on him for, for strength, and integrate their faith in their work, it affects every other area of their lives. Thank you very much, Kathy. I appreciate that. And you know, I'm really glad that you mentioned social media as uh, one of the resources available. I forgot to say that in my own remarks, that that's, of course, changed everything. So remember the Cindy Lauper song, A Money Changes Everything? Social media has changed everything, and sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. So I appreciate it. Maybe we'll have time to come back to that because it's a big topic. Chip, would you jump in next? Uh, so talking from Northwest Arkansas, a very special place. I go out there a lot and know it very well. But you're in the Big Apple. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think, I think there's some tensions that we're navigating. Um, and one is more from an observation of being a part of this for uh, 15 years. And another, the other two come from some research that we just did at VOCA, and we'll talk more about that research in our breakout tomorrow. But um, the first tension is, is fragmentation, and it's, it's that the conversation is definitely enduring, the faith and work conversation, but even what we mean by the faith and work conversation is often different. And, and as you poke into that a little bit, you find that it's not just different, that there's some, there's some judgment mm -hmm. underneath the surface. You know, my, you my faith and work is better than your faith and okay. work. In fact, my faith and work is the legit faith and work, <laughs> and yours really isn't. And, and I think, you know, to really, to really gain momentum, I think we need to find a center, mm -hmm. which, which is probably, it's probably surrendering to the lordship of Jesus in our careers. It's really probably that simple. And, and it, probably, it touches on all four quadrants of your grid. And, mm -hmm. But, but I, I see that and, and find that. And so that's one, the one issue, one tension is fragmentation. Second, a second tension um, has to do with the fact that this movement is aging. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we studied in our, in our 
in our research was where do people turn to solve their work challenges? And almost 50% of boomers turn to their faith and only 3% of Gen Z do. Hmm. And so the kind of, uh, the, which would fit into your, enrich, your enrichment yeah. category, Elaine shared a lot about how she goes to work with the sense of God's presence and guidance and power. Like that's, that is not shared by the vast majority of people going to work mm. irrespective of their faith <laughs> commitments. Mm. So there's an aging issue there. Mm. And the third, the third tension we see is the ascendancy of the self. Mm. So um, a Gen Z person, only 3% of them turn to their, their faith, 11% of them turn to themselves. And this sovereign self keeps rearing its head more and more, I think, in our culture. And, you know, God made us with an individual identity and gifts and power and calling. So there, you know, Christianity does not erase our individuality as other faiths may. Uh, and yet, you know, we still need to surrender to a sovereign God and to the voice of our community mm -hmm. that helps us discern our calling and find our path. And I think, so I think that's a sort of tension slash challenge point that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, of, I come out of sort of the Calvinist tradition, and there's a sense of the church gathered and the church scattered, and there's always this movement of gathered and scattered, and whether it's church gathering on, on a Sunday or whether it's a small group, but the sense of community. I mean, God made us to be in community, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, as well as uh, our own individual identities. So thank you for that. Just powerful stuff you're doing in a tough marketplace. Bill, um, share some thoughts. You've been thinking about this for a long time. I have, and... Like you, I'm sort of at an intersection for a lot of people in the network. And so by the day, I get encouraged hearing new things going on that I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that. And it's wonderful. It's like, oh, wow, God's at work, you know? i, I got to remind myself of that. And we mentioned some of those tonight. We mentioned the ERGs. I just think that's a fantastic development. And... I don't know, maybe it's been going on forever, but it just seems like since the 2018 summit, that's a, that's a new sun rising on the horizon, it seems to me. Yeah. And I think the DEI thing is, is helping us. Uh, nobody's mentioned impact investing. Hmm. I mean, that's really coming on strong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people really trying to actually provide real live income for people, you know, through... Uh, let's say, uh, enlightened capitalism and, uh, you know, really giving people dignity through work. Um, there's a whole bunch of fellows programs and gap year programs that are trying to give a vision for work to young adults, um, which, of course, dovetails into the, all the wonderful work that uh, groups are doing with business students and with college students and so forth. And so, you know, I, I just get excited about where all that's going. And then at the same time, I sort of step back and look at a bigger picture um, and just a data point. Uh, Eric Welch and uh, I and, and two or three other people, we basically funded a question with Barna. Uh, this is probably about five or six years ago. Um, we could only afford one question. <laughs> but I bet it was a good one. Tell us, what was it? Well, I believe, that Eric can, can correct me, um, but I believe the question was, Barna asked a representative group of what they identified as, uh, uh, you know, church-going Christians, okay? So, like, presumably their faith is legit. And the question was, do you believe that your work... 100% of your work is something God cares about. It was something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And basically, it came out to about 10% said yes. Wow. And Eric's in touch, as I think Chip is, with a bunch of other research that others have done kind of along these lines, like how, how much uh, penetration have we really gotten with the idea that work matters to God? And it, it always seems to come out somewhere around, you know, 10% of the church, or I should say of, of the Christian population. Which, you know, I, I step back and I go, so I've devoted, you know, my career 40 years now uh, to that message. Have we made a dent? 
And, you know, part of me is like, well, it could have been 2% when you started, Bill, so, you know, rejoice. <laughs> you but, kept it from going backwards. But I, I, I look at the, like, 90% of the people that we're going to church with, apparently, they don't get it. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to get discouraged by that. I just sort of use that as a, okay, then we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and I, I'll make one other observation about where we stand. I do think, thanks, David, you pointed out, we do need to move from the wow to the how. What I find is the more we move toward the how, the more challenging the task becomes as a movement because the experience of work is so diverse. It, it, you know, the how looks a whole lot different in Northwest Arkansas, you know, it, than it does in the, app, the Big Apple, mm -hmm. right? You just have different challenges, different language, different realities that you're dealing with. That, the wow, uh, I'm sorry, the how looks a whole lot different for, you know, the lady who's cleaning the hotel room where you may be staying tonight, um, you know, than it looks for somebody who's going to put several million dollars into a venture, right? Mm -hmm. They're all Christians, they all want to serve Jesus, but then they say, okay, my work matters to God, so now what do I do? And, and you find yourself, you've got such a diversity, and so the movement has a hard time staying coalesced as a movement because it, I guess we go back to what you said. We can, we can all agree Jesus is Lord. That makes a difference in our work. But after that, it's like, okay, yeah. all, all the investment people go over to this room, all the janitors go over to this room, you know, all the housemakers go over to this room. I mean, it, it, it's a challenge. And add to it the, that everyone in this room could afford to tum, to pay whatever the registration exactly. fee is, your hotel fee, your flight if you flew, and even just time away from work that you could do it. So a lot of people, when I go back to the Element Hotel tonight, the people there are probably holding two or three jobs. Right. They can't come here. And yet they're children of God, and their work matters to God as well. Yeah. As you've been talking amongst yourselves, did, did anything spark your interest between you three that someone else that one of the one of you said that you'd like to comment on you know Catherine mentioned collaboration and um i think there's there is some of that happening across the movement and um around our research we you guys collaborate we collaborated together on some of that and and have over the years i think that's that's true and and yet i also think that as it gets bigger and there's more and more entities um we're competing for oxygen Mm. And so it's kind of like, you know, we all get paid somehow. So there's there's that whole different. We don't like to talk about all that stuff, but no, it's still real. it's part of the reality of it. It's like, how do we each survive? You know, and are we rewarded for collaborating? Does that feed our economic engine or not? It's kind of an interesting yeah. question to probe into. But I, I think that I think there is a community here, and um, of of wonderful people who enjoy seeing each other and it was happening all over the place in the lobby as we all came in. So I think that that's, that's an asset and it's, it, it leans us to, to finding, even if we're not, we don't actively collaborate on projects all the time, it's that we are kindred spirits in the same fight. And if I could, um, collaboration, not just for the sake of collaboration, but really finding a project that, that does- Win-win. It is win-win-win because it's also a win for the people we serve. Yeah. And, um, and there's, a, there's an excellent book, Well Connected by Phil Butler, that really lays it out well. Um, in fact, Martha Brangenberg and I are gonna do a workshop tomorrow at 115 to talk about a case study for collaboration and some of the successes and, and some of the failures that we've seen. But I really do feel like we are supposed to be the body of Christ, each performing our function where it makes sense. You don't want the foot working with the hand, that's not gonna work, but the foot working with the ankle or working with the, you know, with the calf, yes, you know, so, so finding a way for all of us to work together so that it accelerates our ability to achieve our missions and expand God's kingdom or advance God's kingdom, that's, that's what we're looking for with collaboration. Bill, anything uh, spark your reflection as you've been listening to your colleagues here? Well, David, I'm such a contrarian. Um, it's not what they said, it's what none of us has said. Um, and that is, uh, if I just look at, okay, where are we today and what are the issues? I mean, like one big 
elephant in the room is AI, and, and, and none of us has talked about that. And honestly, we don't have any workshops or any speakers talking about AI, and you think, how could you overlook that? And there's some reasons why that. Basically, uh, we, we, had, we had too much content, and there's so many things going on now, conferences and so forth. So it was like, well, somebody else is, people who know AI ought to, you know, have conferences on that. But it, but it is, I mean, it, it holds, you know, promise and it holds real perils. And I, I'm like, well, what are Christians going to do about it? And I don't know. I think we're still figuring that out. But I will say this. What AI poses to the world and therefore to the church, the big question mark is what does it mean to be human? That's a question of what we call theological anthropology. And the thing that excites me in that score is that the church, by virtue of the revelation that we've been given about human personhood by God, we hold an understanding of what it means to be human in ways that the rest of the world simply doesn't have. And it may well be that as our culture and people in our culture slowly lose their sense of humanity, the church becomes like an oasis, if I can use the word, like a monastery of, of for, for, for people in the world, they realize, wow, whenever I hang out with those Christians, I feel more alive, I feel more human. I want to move toward that. That, that at least is my hope for where the church would go with it, where we would go with it as we interact with our coworkers. And that's really good because I, I think even without the AI conversation, post-COVID work has been dehumanized, knowledge work. And it's, it's not going back, it's, it's changed. It's more transactional, teams and colleagues are less connected, and so that's an opportunity for us. That's well said. One thing that sort of bridges this panel of where we are today, which when what's coming down the road on AI, and think of other things like CRISPR babies that are going on, if you haven't followed that, of, of creating babies. You design them, the genes, you change them. Uh, human augmentation. Uh, we've had that for a while. Uh, people have a prothesis or something like that, and we kind of accept that. But uh, various war departments are putting things about chips into brains. It, it's extraordinary things. Uh, bioengineering. And, and here the movement might want to uh, figure out who, because the average pastor, that's going to be hard for them. Uh, we're doing things like that with our humble little Princeton University Faith Work Initiative. We're, we're sitting at the table where they're talking about these policy decisions. Well, what does it mean to be human? Uh, and, and there are other, other places, University of Miami at, at Ohio, uh, Brett Smith's doing a great job. So there are, a lot of, there are a lot of academic places where that's part of their job to stay on top of this, where Christians are doing research and bringing that Christian voice. So maybe one of the things is to encourage those folks, you know, in, in the academy, not to dump it all on them, but turn to them for some, some guidance. I mean, every day I'm realizing how much I don't know. It's crazy. You might also turn on a slightly lighter note that some clergy, both rabbis and Christian clergies, have um, given their homily or their service, and everyone's like, oh, that's wonderful. It turns out it was AI generated, the whole thing, the whole thing. So what do you make of that? So what was the large language model that they did to draw the service from? Was it a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Pentecostal? I don't know. So... It's fascinating. We have landed the plane. There's exactly minus four seconds left. So how about a huge round of applause for this great panel? All right. And last but not least, we have uh, the challenges and opportunities we face. In other words, the ghost of Christmas future. So please have a seat, Helen and company. And uh, in the interest of time, let's just jump right in. Uh, let's quickly go down the row in sort of the 30-second, who am I? All right. Hello. Good evening. My name is Helen Mitchell. I've been in the Faith at Work movement for about two decades. Previously business executive, co-founder, visionary, visionary of the Saddleback at Work ministry at Saddleback Church. I'm currently at Biola University as a uh, ethics, leadership, and strategy professor and director of the Talbot Center for Faith, Work, and Economics. Whew. Rock on, Biola. All right. Yeah. Come on next, Eric. Eric Welch. Um, I serve as Strategic Alliance's Director for the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and I chair the National Faith and Work Association. Thanks. Julia. Hi, I'm Julia Oltmans. 
I'm an employment lawyer by background. I've spent my career in Fortune 500 companies. I had never heard of faith and work until I found myself as the leader of the Christian Employee Resource Group, ERG, at a Fortune 500 company. And so I spent five years leading that. And then I moved over to Coca-Cola Consolidated, which is a Christian but publicly traded company as well. Yeah. Thanks, Ms. Christian. And Dave? Yeah, Dave Haytag, uh, <clears throat> second generation owner of Edgerton Gear. I think I'm the token blue collar guy here. Uh, I've also started a foundation called Craftsman with Character to introduce high school students, uh, primarily kind of at risk kids, uh, giving them a biblical worldview, in them, introduce them to the world of trades and manufacturing without using religious language. Welcomed into the public schools. Last year and a half, my world was turned upside down because the U.S. Navy asked to partner with us to take it national because our U.S. submarine industrial base desperately needs young people to replace an a aging workforce. Wow. Thank you. Thank you in many ways for that. Why don't we start here, Helen, with you. Tell us a bit, what, are you, what did you reflect on to, as you were preparing your, your comments to share with us today? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, I, I think here, as we look forward, I think we have the opportunity to leverage the theological foundation that's been laid and the philosophical uh, conversations been laid over decades to bring together unity in the local church, academia, and the marketplace. And when we talk about that, it's just not business. Interestingly, I've spent the last month in Australia researching, learning, and listening with regard to faith at work or faithful work and had many observations about differences and distinctions. We have a lot of books and conferences, as but mentioned of a number of panels here. We've got a lot of activities, but we may not be as strong in the implementation, formation, and discipleship. So I would suggest that maybe in the Faith at Work movement and in ROI, we may not have the return on the investment that we've had for all of these decades. Australia, on the other hand, it seems to be far more entrepreneurial. And I agree with you that a lot of the global challenges, a lot of the Faith at Work challenges we see are very global. And I'll just say very quickly, there are three things. There are many things that we've touched on here already today in the previous panels, but um, I say there are faith at work global challenges that are magnified in countries such as Nigeria and Indonesia. But three in particular, I think that we could share and that we could address. The first one is the congregation. Broadly, I don't think we have a good understanding. And as David Gill talked about earlier, we do not have a good understanding and application of the value of work, ministry, and work as a calling and really how to live it out. Um, we're malforming individuals, in my opinion. There's a lack of discipleship and a lack of discipleship of one's work life. Um, I find that too many are finding they're still seeing work as a means of and purpose to do church ministry activities, sharing one's faith, being a good moral person. There's still a big gap in beliefs and behaviors. We're not really talking about an understanding the intrinsic value of work. We're not really talking about the kingdom of God aspect of work and what that's called to do. Second, I think there's a gap and an opportunity in the future is to really uh, lean into the local church. The church is still not at the table. There are few exceptions. From my perspective, church is not at the table. The church as an organization needs to embrace an organizational change effort that includes people, process, structure, technology, and theology. And that's why we don't have, in my, my research and work, we don't have the DNA into the local church to really activate and have the transformation and have real application. There's been more than four years of research and partnership with my, Chuck, my friend Chuck Proutfit over here. We've been working on a faith, work, money, church integration inventory, and that's given us objective data and a view into what some of these roadblocks are, the beliefs and the behaviors. And it supports what I've been saying for 20 years, or maybe not quite so long. Number one, the church is internally focused on our own programs and initiatives. We do not see the equipping of saints in their vocational ministry as core to the mission of the local church. Number two, business as an industry by the local church is viewed really to fund the local church, not as an intrinsic value, be one of the four core drivers that direct and, uh, and order uh, society and people's lives. Number three, work, uh, pastors will tell us, our research says that work has an eternal value, but it's predominantly for evangelism, not for the very intrinsic work itself and the ability to affect and change culture, society, and the way we have life and human flourishing. 
Uh, leadership is not fully in, a, in the local church, is not fully and appropriately on board. What we found through our data and our research over four years is that leadership is statistically significant in causing culture, not just correlated, but causes the culture of the local church as it relates to faith, work, and money, which leads to what I've been saying for years, that we have too much of sizzle to fizzle. We have pastors and people will go get programs and get excited and come to things like this, maybe go back to their organization, try something, we go sizzle to fizzle, there's no there's no roots, no transformation. And lastly, just to close with this, is the third thing is that the, the, the next generation. As a university professor working with Gen Z, they're hungry for authenticity. They want to see a better world and to live a life of purpose, but they're really not getting that from their local church for the most part. So we need a both a top-down and a bottoms-up approach. And uh, years of research by the Barner Group shows that there's a, there's a link between the, the youth understanding their work and calling and their commitment to the local church and walking out their mission and their calling. So we do that very well at Biola University, but I know that's only a small segment of the youth that are getting that approach. So those are the three opportunities I see as we need to move this movement forward. Terrific, Colin, thank you. You know, I'm reminded, uh, yeah, well, I guess, absolutely. <laughs> So, you know, as you're talking, and you, you ended with, with youth and uh, yeah. the children, can I jump down to you, Dave, because that's part of what your passion is, and could you connect the dots, but take us where you go as you think about these questions, please. Yeah, Helen, thank you, because my mind goes to the kids that are completely unchurched, and what I'm finding over and over, I, I'm 61, been, been involved in the faith and work movement, I, Pete Hamden was a mentor, Paul Stevens. Um, and what I'm finding, these kids are desperate to be mentored. They want a worldview that says I matter, I fit, um, and we have this craftsman code that we take kids through that I'm not the center of the universe, I don't know everything or nearly as much as I think I do, and it's really fun to get kids to make, make, make them say that, especially if you're parents. But what I'm finding, my struggle, and I'm gonna be very honest, um, I don't know what to do with these kids once they come through our course because we give them a biblical worldview. And, I gotta, and I'm gonna get in trouble here, so I'm gonna blame somebody else. Um, Dot, where are you, man? Where, there you are, bro brother. So Dot said something to me. <laughs> so if you don't like what I'm gonna say, blame him. But, but he helped me understand that when we take these kids through, and again, we're in the public sco schools, we're not using religious language, we're giving them a biblical worldview, we, we deconstruct their worldview and then we rebuild it. And what Dot helped me understand one day, you know what I'm gonna say, he says, and I'm going to try to get it right. He said, salvation is not a prerequisite for discipleship. Yep. And that was really profound to help me understand that when I'm working with these kids and Dot goes back to the disciples, they didn't know what they're getting into. These kids don't know what they're getting into that we're, we're working with in the high schools, but they are hungry for truth. Yeah. And so the struggle I'm having, this is where I'm going to get in trouble. I don't know what to do with them. Because another conversation, again, this is Dot, not me saying this, but it's Dot. I said, you know, I said, Dot, we were having a talk one day, and I said, you know, and I'm going to be honest, I can't send them to church. And Dot says, no, you can't, because the church will ruin them. <laughs> wow, wow. That's a tough statement, right? Wow. Yeah, right? And why does it ruin them? Because it makes them irrelevant. They learn, they learn to be religious, but they don't learn to be people of goodness and character because the kingdom of God, God is about goodness. And we need to teach these people and these kids to be good. And that's how we introduce them to the kingdom. And too often our churches don't know what to do with that. Wow, wow. Do you have a suggestion, even a way to point forward? Because I saw a lot of heads nodding. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble again. Go for it. Hey, <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> so what I So this goes to the second challenge that, that I really struggle with too. Um, I don't know where I fit. Um, I try not to get emotional on this, but it's all right. I will anyway. I've been married 32 years. Came out of Regent College because God called us back to the family business. My wife and I have been in 13 churches in our marriage, and <clears throat> only one affirmed who I am in my ministry, that I have a full-time ministry. And, I, and I'm going to be honest, I'm going to get in trouble again. I can't believe how many faith and work people still use the term full-time ministry, referring to pastors and missionaries and those kind of folks. It is an insult to folks like me and so many business people that I know who own businesses who look at their machine shops as their job sites, as their ministry, their full-time ministry, right? So, 
So we, so we got to get rid of that language. And the other thing, there's folks like us who are going, the church isn't affirming us, encouraging us, inspiring us, so what do we do? We form, form coalitions with each other because we support, we know the issues that are going on. And here's the big thing that I think the church is absolutely missing. In our workforces, we have believers, maybe not even believers, who are incredible mentors, but the church is not telling us that they are the ministers to these kids, right? The church is telling telling us that we have to leave it up to the professionals. But I got guys who are bankrupt, divorced twice, addiction issues, who are phenomenal mentors. So if we want to reach this next generation, we got to affirm, affirm these people and say, you know what? The ministry is yours. And here's the last thing I say. I don't want to manipulate things or mon- monopolize. I spoke at a church a couple years ago. And, I, and if, you're, if you're a pastor, I encourage you to try this little trick because I completely set up this congregation. And it was actually kind of embarrassing, but it was fun too. So I asked the congregation, I said, you know, I want to get to know you a little bit. So if you could please tell me how many of you are here called to full-time ministry? My wife knew what I was doing. She stood up. Four other people stood up out of 400. And then I said, okay, how many, how many plumbers do we have in the audience? One little guy, older guy in the second row, kind of, I go, sir, please stand up. Thank you for your service. And I said, please stay standing. How many truck drivers, health care workers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, school teachers? I mean, health, I, mean I kept going on. I got everybody in the whole congregation to stand. And we're all having fun. And then I got real serious. And I said, why didn't you all stand when I asked the first question? Here, here. I ask you to do that in your churches and see what kind of response you'll get. Yep. See if the message is getting through. Dave, thanks for that passion and uh, those stories. Yeah, appreciate it. Julia, would you mind sharing your thoughts? Uh, yeah, you go? I would just agree with Dave. I think, you know, when we first formed the um, Christian ERG at Zurich Insurance, um, I assumed that most people were going to be active in their local church, right? The people were, that were going to be joining were going to be people who were already doing things and serving in their local church. And I found there were so many people that were unchurched, right, that were getting plugged in and and um, going deeper in their relationship with God in the ERGs than I expected. So, for example, the first small group I was a part of, there were five of us women, only two of us were engaged in a local church, and the other three were not, and the other three were just trying to learn to read the Bible for the first time, and I was so shocked. I, I just, again, didn't think that there would be so many people, there'd be such a reach, right, that the ERG would have of folks who were not currently engaged in their church, and so I think while... Um, it can look different ways in different organizations, right? It doesn't have to be the formal ERG structure. It could be an informal fellowship. Um, it can, again, have, take different forms. But I do think that real discipleship is happening in these fellowships inside of corporations. Um, there's unity that's happening among the body of Christ because we're coming together with people of all different denominations and learning from each other and, and growing in fellowship and um, supporting each other and and going deep when, you know, um, we first started a prayer call when the, the ERG first formed, and we only had two or three folks who would attend the prayer call each week. I was really discouraged by that. I'm like, God, we need to be praying for this group, right? We just formed this group. We need to have people coming for prayer. I was really discouraged. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. And then we had 70 people every week coming to the prayer meeting and people sharing really hard stuff that they were going through, right, and having others pray for them. People who'd never prayed out loud before, right, had the chance to see it modeled by somebody else who was coming from a different church tradition. I will say, right, the folks that came from the black church who were part of our prayer group were instrumental in teaching people how to pray, right? And then others seeing that and being feeling emboldened to pray and, and, and to share hard things and to walk through tough things together. I just have seen um, in that environment people come together as the body of Christ. Like, I'm not seeing it outside of, you know, in other, in, in churches, right, in other um other places. And so I just really think we have a huge opportunity to take advantage of that, um, to, to continue to see unity develop, to continue to see um, coming together on polarizing issues. These ERGs are coming together again with the other ERG groups and talking about really hard subjects. And we've had the opportunity 
to prove to people that Christians are different than what you're seeing on social media, right, or what you perceive Christians to be, we're able to show, no, Christians, like, care about you. We, we, you may be of a different faith than me. You may have a different belief system than I do, but I still, I love my neighbor, and I'm, and I'm going to care for you, and I'm going to walk with you, and I'm going to pray for you, and, and just build a relationship with you so that I have the opportunity, right, to, to show that I care. So I am just seeing beautiful examples of people coming together in ways that, unfortunately, I haven't seen in the church, and I haven't seen in other environments. It's, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I, I, I think you, you touched a lot of uh, chords uh, with, us, with us here. And there's, there's something about the nitty-gritty of work. It's ups, it's downs, it's highlights, it's, it's, it's horrors that makes it real. And when people can come and talk about real things as opposed to putting on our, our Sunday best, there's something edgy and real about that. So thank you. Eric, would you bring us home? Uh, what have you been thinking about as we look at, um, as we look at the, where we are here and the, the challenges and opportunities ahead of us? Sure. Well, I was, I was uh, glad that Bill Hendricks brought it up because, you know, a number of the research does show that 85 to 90 percent of Christians in the United States still do not fully integrate their faith in their work. And when we're in our faith and work bubbles, right, it's, it's wonderful, but I think we have to step back and acknowledge that. Now, I do think, to Bill's point, that it was much less and that much advance has happened in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and so I do think we have an opportunity to gr be grateful. But I think much of this lies in uh, the proclamation of the cultural mandate of Genesis 128 alongside the great commandment and the Great Commission. I think sometimes we talk about those in a vacuum, but talking about those together is a very powerful trio, or even quattro, if you throw in that the Great Commandment is really two commandments. But, um, and then I also think this, this uh, four-chapter gospel story narrative of creation, fall, redemp redemption, restoration comes in different forms, but that broadening, there is a core of the gospel, but that broad story uh, helps to really um, paint the picture of Genesis 1 and, um, and the cultural mandate that's so important to this, this movement um, and God's kingdom. I also think uh, another major opportunity is to continue the culture creation. You know, Andy Crouch wrote a book a number of years ago called Cultural Making that still stands as an excellent example of our opportunity to create business, art, education and, and many of our forefathers have done just that and as you look at many of our institutions formed for God's glory and, uh, and, and for his purposes and for the flourish, flourishing of all and, um, and so continuing that uh, is uh, in all of those areas is huge. I do think we must also continue to engage culture. I do think um, seeing Christians more confident and courageous and clear in their biblical convictions and, and able to winsomely describe those things. I think we have to push back against the passivity. We also have to push back against the over-aggressiveness. But we have to press into this winsome engagement on political and cultural issues, know where we stand. And I think the Christian ERGs are a great example of that, happening, um, having respectful dialogue as we build a truck for Ford together, right? Um, I also think a couple other opportunities are K-12 in college. You know, Barna reminds us that many people are formed. Their formation occurs by age 13. I think seeing more of these things in especially K-8, K-12, as well as uh, college. Um, we've talked about the Christian ERGs. We'll hear more about them uh, this weekend, but so much wonderful happening there. Christian-owned business, if you look at, at Christian, the Christian-owned business movement and the entrepreneurship movements, I mean, they are increasing rapidly and winsomely um, on all issues, as well as the, the, uh, the investment movement. I do think, as, as has been said multiple times, this happening more and more in churches is such an important um, aspect of this. And uh, while there is much going on, that needs to multiply many times fold. And I think the co-vocational pastor movement, I think many in this room maybe being called to uh, stand alongside others in leading together. Basic discipleship, 
you know, 70% of American adults self-identify as Christian. 30% say they're, they have received Jesus as Savior. But only 4% strongly affirm the basics of the Christian faith. And when you add faith and work to that, it's 1%. I think we have to teach the basics of the Christian faith along with these principles of faith, work, and economics. And, and lastly, our John 17 unity as one in our cities, our nation, and, and globally is such an opportunity. And I think this, as uh, um, Jerry sh shared, this Lausanne meeting in Seoul this September will be a wonderful demonstration of that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Eric. Great thoughts. Um, so before I turn it back over to our MC, to Eric, let me be so foolish as to try to summarize a couple of thoughts and themes I've, I've heard. Um, First, one thing we haven't mentioned is worth noting, workplace chaplaincy. A phenomenal thing going. As, as you'll know, uh, in, 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 as Catherine would know in Northwest Arkansas, Tyson Foods have about 140,000 employees. They have more chaplains, workplace chaplains, on their payroll than some companies, religions do clergy. They have over 100 chaplains, full time, working to be there not to proselytize, but to be the face of Christ and to show love and help and healing because some of those jobs are really, really hard jobs in that food sector. So workplace chaplains. In fact, many clergy I know retire from their church to do that because they finally get back to doing what they really care about. And I want to give a slight, defense is the wrong word, but remind us it is awfully doggone hard to be a clergy person today in a traditional church. All the forces are against you declining attendance, COVID, uh, secularization, uh, the politics, they try to take a middle row, you know, hit the ball down the middle of the course, uh, and the people on one side will scream at them for not being more vocal than the other side screams. It is really hard. I have several clergy friends. I'm ordained myself, but don't have a, a church in the traditional sense. It's a hard job. So maybe one way we could help them that I'll leave as a, as a challenge, uh, and it's easier if you're a white-collar worker, but invite your clergy to your place of work. And if you're an hourly worker and it's a little bit, you know, have them come at a shift change. Ask your boss if you could just kind of show them what you do or meet in the canteen or something like that. But otherwise, bring them to your work. Show them what you do and tell them about it. And ask them, uh, would, you, would you mind including stories about what we do day to day, how you help, can help us theologically encourage that? Uh, I, I have uh, concern and hope for the future, which is maybe a healthy place to be. Uh, I, this is, the movement is clearly alive, it is clearly flourishing, it is clearly growing and changing all around the world, as we heard from Elaine and some others. And I wanted to leave with a, a, a quick story and a line. The quick story is once I was in Atlanta, got out, got a rental car, the Hertz driver, it takes like two in the morning, it's raining, and uh, I was exhausted, I'm just kind of sitting there. And the bus driver, she was, she didn't push the button, the recording of where you are and where we're going. She, first thing she said, she said, child, you just look so tired, are you all right? And I said, well, yeah, I am tired. And she, she just like lifted me up, she was buoyant, where are you going, where are you, are you away from your family, do you miss them? And I said, wait, 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 you really like your job, don't you? She said, no, the job's horrible, but I love the people. I love the people. She said, I could be the face of Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Wow. So, so I want to I, I leave... <laughs> I want to leave the thought that it's not always what we do or it's end purpose, which is really important, the intrinsic, but it's how we do it. We may be placed somewhere there like that Hertz bus driver at four in the morning or two in the morning, whatever it was. Lastly, when I was ordained, the man who preached the service is a mentor of mine. Um, he used this, the title of the sermon, which I will leave you with in close and give it back to Eric, was the secular, uh, the secular is the arena for the sacred. The secular is the arena for the sacred to break in and through. With that, Godspeed. Thank you all, and thank you, great panelists. Thank you.